Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, and I'm here today at the James Julia Auction House looking at some of the guns they're going to be selling in their upcoming October of 2016 firearms auction. And what we're taking a look at today are some sniping rifles from the U.S. from World War I. Now there are two main versions of U.S. World War I sniping rifles, um, although they're really the same rifle. These are all the uh, model of 1903 Springfield rifles but they have a two different primary types of optics. One over here is the Warner and Swayze, originally the model of 1908. This one and most of them are models of 1913 rifle, or uh, scope. And then the second option was the Winchester uh, Model A 5 power scope, or Winchester A5. And that's what we have on both of these two. And there's some interesting, well, they're very different scopes, and there's some really cool history behind some of these. So let's dig into it. So in the United States Army, early on, the official optical site, it was called a musket site, telescopic musket site, for the Springfield 1903 rifle was the Warner and Swayze. And this is a, it's not a good scope. Um, it's probably the worst optic that the US military has ever adopted. It's heavy, it's awkward. Um, the thing weighs two and a quarter pounds. That's a little more than a kilo. It's a heavy scope. Um, the models, uh, model 1908 was a six power, which is not bad, uh, but they determined that that was actually more magnification than necessary and had a smaller field of view than they would like. So the model of 1913 uh, tweaked things a bit, uh, reduced the magnification to 5.2 power, which allowed them a little bit larger field of view. That's good. Um, it is a prismatic sight, so you can still use stripper clips with the rifle. The adjustments to this scope are all external. Um, it's the the elevation here will take it out to 3,000 yards, and they have a little plaque on top giving you data on wind and, <laughs> and uh, spin holdover and compensation. The idea of spin being the bullet drifting based on its own uh, revolution, and that's, that's a factor that isn't even an issue until 1,000 yards, really. And boy, the, the chances you'd actually be able to use something like this to make a 1,000-yard shot are pretty infinitesimal. Anyway, that was the official Army scope. They bought... Uh, about 5,750 of them, and they were used both on the Springfield rifle and on the model of 1909 Benet Merci uh, machine gun, which was a copy of the Hotchkiss portative. So as for World War I, probably about 1,500 of these went on to sniping rifles, 1903s, that went to World War I. So the A5 was one of the best commercial scopes on the market at that time. Uh, you could get it in three, four, or five power magnification, which would have been called the A3, the A4, or the A5. Um, Winchester did have some other scopes out. There was a B5, for example, a scope model B at five power. Um, the U.S. Army chose the five power magnification version for sniping. Uh, it's interesting that in World War I, they really wanted the magnification. They had five power here. We had 5.2 or six power over here. That would change in World War II. But for the time being, despite this being a small tube, it was a five power magnification. Um, the scope is a bit fragile. It's very precisely made. It's interesting, one of, the, one of the features about this A5 is that these tubes were actually made from solid bar stock that was drilled out and then bored on a lathe instead of being a piece of drawn tubing. And that made them much more precise and concentric, which is a good thing for a telescopic sight. Obviously, the Warner and Swayze isn't built in such a way that that matters. But uh, these were... You know, if these are fixed in place, you run the risk of, say, destroying the reticle with the recoil from a shot. So the way they actually worked was that the scope's kind of actually floating in its mount. In fact, I can... The mount is spring-loaded, pushing up against these adjustment tabs. And when you fired, the inertia would tend to make the scope stay in place while the rifle recoiled backwards. Because it's floating in its mount, when you fire, the scope's going to slide forward like that. So in between shots, in addition to working the bolt to load a new cartridge, you're also going to pull the scope back into position so the eye relief is proper. The zero comes back for your next shot. It's interesting that the U.S. Marine Corps has historically prided itself on its marksmanship, especially comparing itself to the Army in that regard. And the Marine Corps scopes were much more set up around precision shooting as opposed to military durability. So we see this. This came out of like an artillery design bureau meant for serious combat, where you want the primary objective is that the scope stays there and keeps working, regardless of maybe how well it actually shoots. 
where these guys are designed for precision. You may break them, but as long as you take care of them and you're a little gentle with them, they'll be very precise scopes. So we have these two interesting different schools of thought there. Now, we're going to take a close look at all three of these rifles, but I do want to point out before we get into that, that this one here in the back is particularly interesting to me because this, as far as I can tell, and I can't prove it, but by all accounts, it appears to be a marksman's rifle from well before the war. Uh, it's a 1908 barrel. And it seems like this was a rifle that was used by a service member for national match competition. And it's the sort of thing that would have gone into World War I with a really skilled precision shooter. Whether this one went to World War I or not, I have no idea. I don't have any documentation on it, but it's exactly representative of the type that would have. So we'll get to this one, but let's start with these two, which are the standard military issue sniper rifles for the US from World War I. All right, we'll start with this guy. This is a model of 1903 Springfield with an A5 scope on it. This is a military contract uh, rifle. If we take a close look at the front of the barrel, we'll see it's a Springfield Armory made barrel from February of 1918. So this is a World War I era uh, barrel and rifle. Now the scope mounts for this style are interesting because this used what was called a man uh, tapered base type of scope attachment where you've got dovetails for the front and back rings, but there are no locking screws. What happens is as you push the scope farther forward on these bases, the dovetail widens and locks the scope in place. So I have this nice and loose right now. You can see I can just slide the rifle, the scope right off the rifle. Uh, this rear base is where we have our windage and elevation adjustments. In fact, let's take a closer look at that before we put it back on. One of the main changes that Winchester made for the military version of this scope was to add this bat wing looking piece of sheet metal there. That acts as a nice little pointer um, and gives you a little bit of friction in your adjustments. We've got just a little bit of tangible stop as a result, uh, but nothing audible. And the way this works is this this plunger is threaded in against the scope, and on this side we just have a spring-loaded plunger. So as I screw this in or out, that plunger is going to push the scope and keep tension on it. It works the same way for elevation. And then our front ring just holds this whole thing in place. The front has this stop ring that you use to set your eye relief because, as I mentioned, between shots, you're going to slide the scope back up to that stop ring. The focus can be adjusted. You can see both the front and the rear caps are threaded in place and you can adjust their exact location. You'll notice we have this nice arrow on the base that tells us which way to install the scope. And one of the modifications that the Marine Corps made when they built these rifles was to take the front handguard here and scallop it out so you have plenty of space for that base to come sliding off the back of the, the mount, or the, the scope to come off the back of the base. So to put this on, I'm just gonna line up the front and rear mounts. It slides on like that. And what will happen is the first time I fire, recoil is actually going to set those firmly in place. So once you've taken a few shots, you'll probably need a small punch and a hammer just to tap these off. So the scope doesn't actually fall off, despite having no actual locking screws. Like uh, German sniper rifles of the same period, this A5 is centrally located over the bore. See that right there? And as a result, it covers the stripper clip guide. So you have access in here. It's not going to interfere with ejection, but you don't have enough space to use a stripper clip. So these rifles would have been singly loaded. And open the bolt, load one or as many rounds as you want in the magazine, and then close the bolt. Because these were not, this isn't a 1903 A4, which would come later in World War II. These rifles were not originally made as snipers. They were converted from standard infantry rifles. So the serial number and the manufacturer's mark and the manufacturer's mark are both going to end up being hidden underneath this scope base. Now let's compare that to a Warner and Swayze. Same exact rifle. Um, you'll notice they didn't have to scallop out the front handguard because there's no scope mount up there. The mounting on the Warner and Swayze is a rail fixed to the side of the receiver. We have our elevation knob right here. By the way, this cruciform thumb screw here 
uh, tightens the elevation down, locks it in place. And the model of 1908 did not have this. So that's the easy visual way to distinguish between the 1908 and the 1913 models. Um, once that's a little bit loose, then we can adjust this. See, I'm at 500 yards, 1,000 yards, 1,500, 2,500. We can go all the way out to 3,000 yards, which is going to be a substantial amount of elevation, which you'll see in a moment. We also have our windage adjustment. Works the same way. This is minutes of angle, so I can go out to 38 minutes, one direction, left, and 46 minutes, the other direction. We'll put that back to zero there. And let's take a look at what 3,000 yards elevation looks like. That scope is positively downward pointed in order to get you that far. Now if we move it back to something reasonable, like 500 yards, that looks a little better. Now you're actually kind of pointing in the same direction as the rifle. Here's our little instruction uh, plaque on the top. Gives you wind values, uh, wind compensation. Drift up here is for the, the effect of the bullet spinning, uh, causing it to drift in windage. Now in order to remove this scope, we have a little spring-loaded catch here. And what I'm going to do is push that catch in and slide the scope forward on its rail. It's going to catch on the bolt. There we go. So there's our rail screwed into the side of the receiver. You see three screws there on the inside. Pretty simple, really. Um, not much to it. And up here we have our manufacturing marks and serial number, which were obscured on the A5 rifle. There you go. This is a telescopic musket sight model of 1913. This one is serial number 2347, made by Warner and Swayze. And then the Warner and Swayze scopes were interchangeable. There was no difference between the scopes and the mounts for the Hotchkiss machine guns, or the Benet Merci machine guns, and the rifles. So these scopes were serial numbered on the inside here when they were issued. And you can see this one is for rifle number 625415, which unfortunately isn't this rifle. Um, matching scope and rifle combinations are virtually unheard of with these. Uh, they typically got mixed up quite a lot. Of course, there is also, lastly, this giant rubber eye cup, which is hardened. It's a little pliable, but not much. Uh, these are pretty much always hardened by this time because they are quite old. And uh, you'll often find these entirely cracked off or torn off. There's a hole here, which was put in. In fact, there's two, I think there's, yeah, three holes. Those are there to prevent suction on this eye cup. Uh, that was apparently a kind of annoying feature in them originally, where they were nice soft rubber, and if you squished your eye up into this, uh, it would actually kind of stick to your face, which was obnoxious. That eye cup is on there because this scope has a quite short eye relief, and even with that eye cup, it was not uncommon to accidentally whack yourself in the eyebrow with this scope when actually shooting. Overall, I mean, the Warner and Swayze was not a really good optics design. In addition to being used by the U.S., it was also used by the Canadians. You'll find pictures of these mounted on Ross Mark 10 or uh, Mark III model of 1910 rifles. All right, now let's take a look at this last one. This is, I think, kind of my favorite of the batch, actually. And it's not quite a military issue gun. So this is a very early 1903 Springfield. Looking at the barrel, we have an October of 1908 uh, manufacture date, Springfield Armory. And then we also have some other very early features of the Springfield. For example, the front uh, handguard here doesn't have a little cutout. That was added to make the iron sight, uh, sight picture a little, uh, little less crowded. They just cut a scallop in the middle there, which isn't present on this one. By 1918, they had added two reinforcing pins or bolts into the stock, and neither of those are present on this rifle. This has a very early style of um, sight knob. That's, that's a pretty esoteric thing, but uh, an interesting feature. And the front of the stock is actually marked with an S, which indicates that the stock itself was very early production prior to 1905. Um, that's a story all for itself involved in uh, the conversion of these rifles from 30-03 to 30-06. However, if we continue to look at this, you'll see that there are elements that just don't quite fit the A5 military issue sniper that we just saw a moment ago. For example, this handguard isn't scalloped out. 
the scope mount is up here, much farther forward. Now it still uses these man tapered bases, but they're not quite as big. The military ones were made larger to be a little more uh, durable. If we look at the rear mount here, it's clearly the same style of mount. This is a free floating scope tube, but it doesn't have that little bat wing piece of sheet metal to give you distinct clicks. These are just free traveling screws. Uh, which is okay if you're a sporting competitor and you know where this is, but you don't have that nice tactile feedback that you would from a military pattern. We can see again here that the serial number has been covered up by this scope base, uh, which would have been the case on a military rifle at the time as well, but also done here. If we look at the stock, you can see that there's some very well done repair work to the stock. Two plugs here, there's a pair of plugs right there, and there are a couple here, and let's see, maybe there, um, on the stock. And I suspect that those were originally the mounting points for an adjustable cheek piece. Lastly, if we compare this uh, rifle side by side with the military one, you can see that while the scopes are the same length, the military scope is actually mounted farther backwards. See, the scope here is kind of right over the line of the striker, where the scope on this guy is over the bolt handle. So, almost two inches of difference there. This rifle, in order to get a proper sight picture, you have to really crowd your face up close on the striker. So, what is this rifle? This is, by all appearances, and of course I don't have any documentation, so I can't prove this, but um, everything about it says that this was a marksman's rifle, a competitive um, a competition shooter who's probably running the national match courses prior to World War I. This rifle would have been manufactured, obviously based on the barrel date in 1908 or maybe 1909, and whoever had this rifle set it up with a commercial scope, commercial mounts, not you know, the same, same uh, model of scope, but not quite the military pattern of everything. He mounted it forward because that was how he tended to shoot. Um, you know, bringing your nose, for example, up to the, the striker on this gives you a really good point of reference, a repeatable uh, cheek weld on the gun. And in fact, you'll find some of these old marksmanship rifles with leather pads set onto the striker, probably for that same reason. And this guy would have competed with this rifle. Now, do we know if this went to World War I? Nope, I have no idea. However, the really skilled Camp Perry National Match shooters for the military um, this, this was a major occupation or a major pastime around this time period. Um, 1908 and the 1912 Olympics, the gold medals in the rifle shooting were both taken by American military personnel. And when World War I broke out, if you were in the Corps and you were deployed overseas and you were a, a national match shooter, you would have taken your match rifle with you. Um, especially given that it's in 30 out 6 and it is a 1903 Springfield service rifle. That rifle went with you. It's not like today where personal weapons are, are absolutely not used in combat. In World War I, th this is your rifle. As a national match shooter, you'd, you would know the dope for this rifle inside and out and be extremely effective with it. Um, and there were, this wasn't strictly an American thing. Early in World War I, uh, for example, the British Expeditionary Force was renowned as a fantastically effective uh, group. The, the marksmanship that, that those uh, British lifetime career soldiers had was really impressive. Uh, there are accounts of Germans thinking they were under machine gun fire, which was actually very accurate, very fast Lee Enfield rifle fire. Well, by 1918, um, when the US troops started showing up, all of those guys were dead. They were very effective soldiers, but they were all killed by artillery and machine guns in the first couple of years of the war. When the Americans showed up, it was this fresh injection of soldiers who truly were expert riflemen. And uh, they really impressed French and British uh, commanders and, and colleague troops with their shooting ability. That was an impressive element that the Americans brought into the war at that point. One last thing that I want to point out, uh, scopes which are removable are militarily always issued with cases. And typically, uh, one is supposed to carry the rifle with the scope detached and the scope safely stowed away in a carry case to protect it from damage and the elements. And uh, these two issue rifles, uh, both are accompanied by matching scope cases. So this is a 1913 uh, Warner and Swayze case. 
opens up there, rather large inside to fit the bulky and squarish Warner and Swayze scope. And then there is an adjustment tool uh, here. Finding that tool with the scope is a quite rare thing. I'm going to leave it in there, it's quite tight. Um, this is a really nice condition case. In fact, this Warner and Swayze scope is extremely good. I don't know that I've ever seen a better one. And perhaps even scarcer is this case for the A5 scope. Um, obviously the A5 is much longer, so it's got this leather case. Set the scope down in there, and then, interesting, then in the top cap of the scope case is a little data table. We've got our shooter's name. This was Private Van Camp, M.H. Van Camp. He's got his rifle's serial number and, uh, and scope dope right in there. Uh, it looks like he has left it blank or perhaps his pencil mark has faded in the last hundred years. But uh, you record all your relevant data there so you don't forget your dope. He also inscribed his own information on the top of the lid. Looks like 13th Regiment, U.S. Marines, Company M. This is a really cool accessory that's really hard to find, and it's really neat to have this along with the rest of the, the scope and rifle setup. So the reticle for this A5 is a nice fine crosshair, and the mount totally obscures your iron sights, so you're not using the irons with this guy. Now the reticle on this match rifle is really curious. You can see it there, it kind of looks like a lollipop. Um, and my best guess would be that that center blob is either, either you set your target directly on top of it, you know, like a six o'clock hold, or it's sized so that it completely covers the black portion of a, uh, a competition match course bullseye. So you would set that over the black part of the target, and make sure that it's, uh, you know, there's no black peeking through, that it doesn't cover any of the white, and that tells you that you're exactly on. That's exactly the sort of thing that a, a really serious mat shooter might very well do for a reticle. Clearly this was a, a scope and reticle and mounting system that was custom ordered, and uh, you could get whatever it was you exactly wanted. Now the reticle in the Warner and Swayze is really hard for me to get a good focus on uh, because of this big eye cup and the short eye relief, but you can see it's a crosshair in the center, and then so then over on the left side here, now normally this would all show up in the same field of view, but I can't quite get the right position on the camera. You've got those three range finding stadia, and those are for an average sized man. You uh, see which one a guy is fitting under, and you'll notice those are all really small. Um, that'll give you a range estimate, and I suspect that's probably 500, 1,000, and 1,500 yards, but I'm not 100% entire, not sure on that. Now with the Werner and Swayze, you sort of could still use your iron sights. Uh, you'd have to kind of hold the rubber eye cup out of the way or take it off, but especially if you took it off, you still have those sights available to you. You can see I just barely see them around the side of the, the eye cup there. Thank you for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. It's rare to get a chance to see any actual US World War I sniper rifle and very cool today to have three different examples that are all interesting in their own right. If you'd like to own any of these yourself, they're all very cool, um, and they are all linked to in the description text below. Uh, three different links for the catalog pages for each rifle at the James Julia uh, website. You can take a look at their pictures, their descriptions, their provenance, and if you're interested in one or all, you can place bids over the phone or come up here to Maine and participate in the auction live. Thanks for watching.